on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. Many people call Cahokia America's best kept secret. I feel like there's a, just a fundamental rewriting of North American history at work here. That was the myth of the mound builders who were more civilized had been a completely separate race. Why did people go to agriculture? It's like so much more work. It was really hard on our bodies. You see shrinking in the skeletons. The center of domestication for the big giant sunflowers, acorns, the American lotus, wild raspberries, and turkeys are being managed. A shaman once told me if I wanted to drink Datura, I would need to prepare for six months and then he would bring two other shaman and they would have to tie me to the ground for three days. And then there was the black drink. Are you familiar with that? I talk about a legacy. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about them. It's just it's pretty, pretty cool to think about. The Cahokia region is so rich. Episode 132 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Feeding Cahokia. Diet of the Mound Builders with Gail Fritz is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Right now at SirThrival.com, all elk antler products are 20% off with the coupon code STRONG20. These extracts are made with the freshly harvested velvet antler of free-ranging American elk and are one of the world's richest sources of growth factors. Humanely harvested in slaughter-free facilities, Sir Thrival's elk antler products are made using the same method developed and studied in Soviet-era Russia and used for their elite athletics and military programs. Known for encouraging anabolism, oxygen utilization, enhancing growth and recovery, repairing tissue damage and stimulating immunity, elk antler is one of the natural world's most unique nutritional supplements. Head over to SirThrival.com where you'll find an incredible product lineup. Supplements like immune-fortifying colostrum and medicinal mushrooms, testosterone-boosting pine pollen extracts, and naturally-derived vitamin D3 with K2. Again, the coupon code STRONG20 gets you 20% off elk antler products until May 22nd. Sir Thrival, why just survive when you could thrive? Right now, I'm wearing my new Wild Fed hoodie. We really took our time choosing these hoodie blanks before we had them printed. They've got a charcoal body and an olive green hood and sleeves. And they've got our Food is All Around You logo on the front with a really cool foraging basket, fishing rod, and suppressed rifle on the back with the text Hunt Forage Fish. These are super soft and comfortable, look great, and work well in the field or in town. I really love the thickness, too. They're fairly light and perfect for the spring days and summer nights ahead. Right now, they're 10% off with the coupon code HFF10 at wild-fed.com. Show your love for Wild Fed and the Wild Food Lifestyle. Head over to wild-fed.com and use the coupon code HFF10, that's shorthand for Hunt Forage Fish 10, for 10% off your new favorite hoodie. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. If you've been listening in lately, you've no doubt heard me and a few of my guests mention Cahokia, an ancient North American city near present-day St. Louis that at its peak habitation may have been home to some fourteen to 18,000 people. The largest and believed to be the most influential city of the Mississippian culture, it was first inhabited around 1050 CE and eventually disbanded around 1350, something like 142 years before the arrival of Christopher Columbus in the so-called New World. While the folks who lived there still hunted and gathered, we now know they relied heavily on a suite of domesticated or semi-domesticated crops. And no, I'm not talking about maize, but rather a handful of species that have come to be known as the Eastern Agricultural Complex. This is significant because unlike maize, which was domesticated in Mesoamerica, present-day Mexico, these plants are native to North America. Our knowledge of this fundamentally rewrites our understanding of North American history and reframes our understanding of the lifeway of the people that inhabited that region. And that brings me to today's guest, Gail Fritz, Ph.D., She's a paleoethnobotanist who worked out of Washington University in St. Louis and a world expert on ancient crops. Gail ran the paleoethnobotany lab at Washington University under the auspices of the anthropology department and is the author of the book Feeding Cahokia, Early Agriculture in the North American Heartland. If you find these topics as fascinating as I do, you'll want a copy for your personal library. 
Now retired, Gail was kind enough to come on the show to discuss her book, her findings, and her impressions about what the diet of the Cahokian people might have been like. She's also passionate about the role some of these once domesticated crops could play in our modern food systems if we were to de-extinct them. A very interesting concept to ponder. I've noticed a trend, and you probably have too, wherever we look in the world, we seem to find that the people who lived there in the ancient past were far more advanced and capable than we once believed. And I don't see this trend diminishing anytime soon. Thanks to folks like Gail Fritz, we're finally getting an unbiased look at the evidence. Gail Fritz, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Your book, Feeding Cahokia, Early Agriculture in the North American Heartland, has just been fascinating to me. And it's funny, uh, just before we started recording, uh, I was on an airplane coming, uh, going to Boston the other day reading your book, and turns out one of your colleagues uh, saw me reading the book on the plane. Huh? <laughs> yeah. This is such a small world, you know. That's Huge coincidence. Yeah. Well, as I had been telling you, a lot of uh, my guests have been bringing your book up lately as well. And I guess um, I want to just uh, start real quickly, um, give a brief overview, and then I'd like to talk a little bit more about kind of how you came to this work. But but briefly, can you tell us uh, what is Cahokia and um, this I, in, in, a, in a give us a brief overview of this idea that there was um, a whole uh, domestication complex, an agricultural complex that was taking place here in North America that you know, somehow I just never really knew that. Um, I feel like a pretty educated layperson, you know, as a non-academic, I read a lot about this topic and it was like, why is this so new to me? Why haven't I heard about this? Many people call Cahokia and other Mississippian mound centers um, America's best kept secret because it's, it's something that, it, you know, school children and, and educated adults can live here most of their lives without ever visiting or, or hearing about. So Cahokia was the largest site north of Mesoamerica, occupied um, at its height between about 1,000 and 1,350 um, of the Common Era. And it, there were tens of thousands of people that lived. It's, it's, it's located uh, in Western Illinois, right across the Mississippi River from the city of St. Louis. And Greater Cahokia, um, as we talk about it, extended across the river, extended to what is now East St. Louis. There was a big mound center there. And then St. Louis City itself had a had a major contemporaneous mound center. And all these people knew each other and were working together, except possibly when they were um, uh, at odds with each other. And we don't know the details about that because it was between, as I said, 1000 and, and 13 or 1400 CE. Um, but there were hundreds of mounds that were built in, in this um, greater St. Louis and Metro East, uh, also known as Greater Cahokia or Greater American Bottom region, and um, all kinds of other sites, uh, ritual centers and uh, towns and farmsteads and small villages, and uh, surrounded by this vast expanse of agricultural land. It's still prime agricultural territory. Um, today, they grow mostly corn and wheat, and it's a horseradish capital of the United States. And oh, the, wow. the town I live in, Collinsville, Illinois, which is also the municipality that uh, Cahokia Mount State Historic Site is located in, has an annual horseradish festival with a horseradish queen and um, <laughs> music and uh, that kind of thing. Um, but the, it's very, very rich um, farmland. Today is mostly mono, big monocultural fields of corn, um, a lesser amounts of, of soybeans and wheat. And every once in a while, there will be a big sunflower field, which is, which is exciting when I see it. I think the last one was only a couple of years ago. So hopefully they'll, they'll plant more sunflowers this year or soon. But um, you also asked about the the other crops, the the native crops. Corn, of course, was domesticated in Mesoamerica and became the the preeminent, the primary staple across North America and much of the of uh, Mesoamerica and South Central America and South America. But here in Eastern North America, where um, where Cahokia is located, for thousands of years there were um, 
there were efforts to domesticate some local plants that I, I feature in the book. And that, again, that people are um, not, that Americans are not very familiar with and, and people in the rest of the world even lesser, lesser so, even though one of them is related to quinoa, which has become a very popular food and healthy food around the world and was also a very popular food here. Although the quinoa that we eat today was domesticated and most of it is imported from the Andean part of South America. Whereas the uh, local uh, quinopodium cousin, they're both in the same genus, quinopodium. The local quinopodium was, uh, was already here growing as a, um, a crop that we would, or, or as a plant that we would probably consider weedy, but after domestication would have been highly productive and grown probably similarly to the way uh, quinoa is grown in Peru and, and Ecuador and or in Bolivia uh, uh, today. I, I so, feel like there's a, just a fundamental rewriting of North American history at work here. And, uh, you know, you're well, let me actually back up here. I want to start, Gail, with just asking about how you came to this, because you're by profession a paleobotanist. Uh, I believe. Could could you tell us like what's a what what is that? How did you come to that? And how did you arrive at you know studying this this domestication complex in Cahokia? Um, wow. You're a highly published uh, scientist. Obviously, I saw quite a few articles that you've published. Um, how, what was the journey that led to this and and paleobotany in general for you? Well, it goes back to my childhood. My father was. Uh, um, a naturalist and a bird watcher and a, a conservationist. And we spent a lot of time out in the woods and we learned to identify many, many plants and animals. And I loved being out there in, in, uh, in nature. And what everyone thought, my father and some of the Audubon Society colleagues and scientists that he worked with always said, oh, she's gonna be a botanist. But I wasn't really interested only in the in the plant science, I was interested in how the plants and people related to each other, how the, uh, or what we would call ethnobotany. And then um, when I got into college and took some, well, my undergraduate major was classical archaeology. And when I discovered that you can actually get paid to, you know, to dig outside and, and to learn all about the uh, ancient cultures and their everything about their life, including the foods that they ate, including the plants that, and, that they grew and ate, I thought, wow, this is, this is for me. Um, so I ended up in, in North American archaeology. And within North American archaeology, I gravitated toward the analysis of the archaeological plant remains. Um, my dissertation was on uh, the Ozark rock shelters in Arkansas and uh, southwestern Missouri, where excavators had in the 30s, in the 1930s, had gone in and uh, removed caches of very, very well-preserved bags of corn and seeds. And a lot of the seeds were um, this quinopod that I just mentioned, the uh, relative of quinoa, and others that had been analyzed and looked at, but, um, and some of them recognized as having been domesticated being and being local um, species, not having been brought from anywhere else, but being Eastern North American plants that, uh, like sunflower is the best known example, that um, whose seeds had been selected to be much, much bigger than ever in the wild and the seed heads themselves, the plant itself had changed. And then other, uh, other, rel uh, other relatives of sunflower and other local plants. And uh, to me, to be able to work with these collections from the rock shelters that were in such good condition, you could see the exact traits of domestication. And, um, and they had been described very uh, briefly, but people hadn't gone into the details of their morphology and they didn't have the tools back in the 1930s that we had in the late uh, 20th century and early 21st century. So such as the scanning electron microscope, which became very, very useful in documenting domestication. So um, 
I got to combine my love of plants and my um, my love of, of, of working outside and, and uh, w with this uh, science of trying to understand the subsistence change and uh, early agriculture in the new world. Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, one of the things that occurs to me when I was a child growing up, the picture of North America, uh, North American history pre colonization was just so different than what we understand it to be today. And I'm, I'm thinking back, it must have been sometime in the last two decades. I remember a book being published called 1491, I think. And, and that was when I first realized just how significant the, you know, the population of North America was uh, when Europeans yes. first got here. And I remember that was like, um, maybe that was like an assemblage of a lot of the new um, archaeology and anthropology. Uh, and it was sort of like saying, hey, we need to readdress how we see this. Then sometime after that, I started to really hear about the Mississippian mound builders. Um, and I started to understand that because at that time, I understood that South America, uh, Peru in particular, and then Mesoamerica had been domestication centers and, and, and civilizations. But I just it, it was like a slow trickle of understanding that this took place in North America. So my first question, I guess, about that is seems like there's a couple things going on. Having, you know, been to the Yucatan and having been to, um, you know, Peru and, and the highlands of the Andes and stuff, those structures there um, are stone uh, and maybe a little bit easier to sort of pick out. So I'm wondering if the mound building here is part of why we this was so uh, obfuscated because things had just grown over and these weren't recognizable as man-made structures, uh, or is this the intentional bias of you know early colonizers? Is it that uh, this civilization had retreated back? so long before Europeans got here? Like, why did we not know that there was not only these, this sort of like city state here, but also that they had a suite of domesticated plants? Like, uh, why is it we didn't know? Um, and uh, to what degree is this recognized today by academics? Like, uh, is this pretty well established in academia and just not made it out to popular culture? Or um, is it still something that many folks in academia don't realize? Um, about the the mounds, there was a definite racist bias. The the American colonists and uh, and before them, the the Spanish and and French um, invaders had um, um, they they definitely they had, they had their sights on the land and wanted felt like it was theirs by divine right and that they could just take it over. And there was a dehumanizing. Um, you know, process that went in to them considering the Native American savages and not capable of having had this kind of civilization. Although the early Spaniards recognized Mississippian leaders as as kings and and as as, as very um, you know powerful and 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 uh, devoted to leaders, and uh, because that early literature was in Spanish, then when the Americans are our, our founding fathers. Um, you know, had I, then their own responsibility to deal and their own uh, to deal with the native people and their own sites on the on the land. They uh, they didn't read it. They didn't know about it. Uh, the the Spanish accounts of the mound builders and the the powerful chiefs um, and the rows and rows of uh, acres, miles and miles of cornfields, um, so that they were definitely agricultural. But um, Everyone recognized that now. So that was the myth of the mound builders, that the mound builders were savage, that the mound builders had been a, uh, I'm sorry, that the Native Americans were savage and the mound builders who were more civilized had been a completely separate race that probably uh. the, the savage barbarians had had exterminated so that and, and that and that this uh, um, race of mound builders could have even been Europeans. And so in that way, we would have just been sort of reclaiming the European heritage. Wow. And that was very widely, widely believed and not actually um, disproven by, you know, in, in the view of, of, of educated people and scientists until the late 1800s, the Smithsonian's uh, mound builder project. Um, which established the continuity between the mound builders and the and the Native Americans that were, existed at the time, and that of course still do in modern times. And um, and Cahokia, though it, it, it had uh, sort of been disbanded 
500 years or so before European contact? Is that, is that something like something like that? Several hundred years. Yeah. I don't, it, not quite 500, but yes, but several hundred years before the, um, well, Marquette and Joliet came down the Mississippi River in the late 1600s. So um, yeah, and then, and, and Cahokia had, was pretty much uh, depopulated by 1350. 14 definitely by 14 not com i wouldn't call it completely empty I, I think there were still there were still activities that went on but it was not nobody was building mounds anymore there weren't it wasn't a city at all anymore after 1350 and when we say mississippian mound builders is that synonymous with the term hopewellian um or are those different things if you could help me understand that Hopewellian was earlier. Hopewellian is a uh, uh, middle woodland time period. So between people in different regions, it started and ended a little bit earlier or later than elsewhere. But it, by 200, 300 BCE, um, the beginning of middle woodland, and then it lasted some places until three or 400 uh, CE, some places until maybe as late as 500. And that the Hopewellians, um, the Hopewellian culture, very loose uh, term, as is Mississippian is a pretty loose term as well, de denoting more than just one distinct language group or tribal affiliation. But the Hopewellian goes along with uh, the Middle Woodland uh, from, you know, the, the time of uh, right, right before and after one uh, CE. So um, and that they were also the Hope Williams were also fabulous mound builders that didn't get to be uh, their mounds were could, even some platform mounds, usually conical burial mounds and lots of other earthworks and long distance trade and beautiful art and um, very, you know, interesting, fabulous. I, I, I again, I would call them both uh, civilizations in, in, in uh, the broadest respect. But um, yeah, Mississippian started uh, right around a thousand. And so, so again, in some places, and some archaeologists would start uh, Mississippian at eight or nine hundred. Certainly, there were developments that were um, were starting to to look somewhat Mississippian. But then the climax was like a, a thousand ten fifty to well, at Cahokia till thirteen fifty or so, and then elsewhere in the southeast until um, European contact. That's really, it's so incredible to me that this is happening here. I mean, it actually makes more sense than what I, you know, believed growing up, but, but it is sort of revolutionizing my perspective. Um, <clears throat> one of the things you talk about in the book is how maize, uh, of course, coming out of Mesoamerica, um, really kind of took center stage when we looked at um, agriculture in North America. Um, and almost to the degree that it is sort of overshadowed um, some of these other plants. And so I was wondering if you could talk about that as well, because I think a lot of folks understand that maize was being grown here. Um, but some of these other plants, uh, even amongst, you know, people who are interested in wild foods, they're not really on the radar. So talk to us a little bit about maize, the role maize played, and then maybe um, when maize actually got here and what was before it, because um, I'm assuming that um, these Hopewellian folks are, they, do they predate the growing of maize in North America? That's a, a good question, and it's debated. We have evidence for a little bit of maize during Hopewellian times. Uh, we used to think we had evidence for more than, it, it never was a lot, but um, about half of the evidence that we did have or thought we had has been looked at more carefully and some of it redated directly dated by um, accelerator mass spectrometry which it, you can only just you can use just a tiny little uh, piece of the corn cob or the corn kernel and get a date whereas um, you know 50 years ago you needed to date like five grams and nobody wanted to destroy that much of something that oh, was rare right, right. so uh, we've actually in, in, in the Cahokia area and elsewhere in the Southeast, we have uh, debunked all the evidence that we had for Hopewelli and Mace. But there are, um, there's another source of evidence called uh, phytolus and starch grains or micro botanical remains that when, um, when it's found in residues uh, on pottery 
which can be direct the residues themselves the charred residues can be directly dated and if there are these little pieces these tiny little starch grains or phytoliths that look like maize and some of that does date to hopewellian times but it's uh the places where it's been found um is north of here in the great lakes and then all the way across to um quebec so and 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 uh, i think there's some in upstate new york or in new york so Right now, we have this, uh, they call it the, you know, this mysterious gap between the, the earliest tiny little specks and then the, um, the fragments of the actual corn cob or corn kernels themselves that you can look through. You still have to look through a microscope to really be sure that they're corn. But, um, and then those can be dated directly. And the earliest ones of those dated directly are um, 600, 700, even as late as 900 CE. So um, even if the Hopewellians did, we're getting some maize. It, maize was a very um, well-developed crop in the Southwest by that time, even in Colorado and Utah, places that are at about the same latitude as, as we are here. So it could, uh, if it, you know, some day length issues had been bred out of it or, um, and it could, I think it could have, have been grown, it could have survived here. And, but um, the, and people probably had seen it every once in a while, but they certainly weren't growing very much of it or eating very much of it. And I think the vast majority of people until eight or 900 AD uh, CE in Eastern North America were, um, were unfamiliar with maize. Is it possible that it had been traded uh, north and that it, you know, wasn't actually grown that, that earliest, those earliest phytoliths, or do you think that those would have come from, from some limited, you know, growing of it? Um, good questions. I, I, I really don't, it could have been traded and some yeah. of it probably was traded and, and eaten without being grown locally. But I, um, as you have alluded to, they were growing other crops. The native Eastern agricultural complex was being, was very, adeptly being practiced across the Midwest riverine area. And I just, I, I just believe that those farmers would have uh, tried growing it themselves. Right. As right. Well. Yeah. yeah, of course. So, so let's talk about, I just, I want to get to the, to this Eastern agricultural complex, but just that one last piece, it seems like for a long time, uh, folks just got really hyper-focused like myopic on the, on the maze and, and missed these other plants. Um, is that just, do you think that's an agriculturalist's bias? Because, you know, we're, may, are, were we looking for, you know, there's this, um, there's this thing about, you know, the domestication centers around the world that they tend to rely on the, the fruits of grasses, you know? So it's yeah. like, right. You see that with, you know, wheat, you see it with maize, you see it with rice, you just sort of see it around the world that, that we get hyper-focused on those. Is, do you think that that bias led us to that? Is that why we, or, or, or is it the, is it the very small seeds of these other plants that led us to sort of ignore them to a degree? Uh, why so much focus on corn? We'll get back to the show in a moment, but first, I'm proud to announce that we've recently started filming for season three of Wild Fed on the Outdoor Channel, which should start airing beginning of 2023. But until then, season two of Wild Fed is now on the air. From the 17-year periodical cicadas of Brood 10 to giant Atlantic bluefin tuna to the bison of Standing Rock's Great Plains, season two of Wild Fed is filled with unique hunts, forages, and incredible wild harvested meals and no shortage of adventure. Watch Monday nights at 7.30 p.m. Eastern and again at 10.30 p.m. on Outdoor Channel. Hey, if you don't have cable, you can still watch the show live as it airs on FriendlyTV.com. That's spelled friendly without vowels, F-R-N-D-L-Y TV.com. You can get a free trial subscription if you want to watch season two, and after that, it's just $6.99 per month. Here at WildFed, we're so proud to have a second season on the air, and we really hope you'll tune in either on Outdoor Channel or FriendlyTV.com. Now, back to the show. I think it's very much a combination of those two factors that you've just brought up. The um, it's hard it's hard to accept as a good food, an important food, a tasty food, something that that uh, that you're only familiar with as a sidewalk weed, 
um, like mm -hmm. you know, la la Goosefoot, Lamb's Quarter, and and then we have actually two two of the Eastern Agricultural Complex members are grasses. One of them, little barley, very closely related to Old World barley. So it, it should be um, you know it, it should strike our fancy as oh this is this could have been good food, but it's just a weed today and we don't eat. Nobody eats little barley. It's hard to process and whatever, uh, however they cooked it or however they had had selected for um, traits that made it more palatable, we're unfamiliar with that. So we, it, you know, it's just hard to consider something something good to eat. And um, and then corn, as you said, is being maize kernels are, and cobs are, are big. And when archaeologists, early archaeologists are were um, excavating, those were the things, it, even a corn cob that has been charred and has been all uh, broken up in the soil. And after you dig it up and put it through, say, a, a, a eighth inch or quarter inch screen, um, a lot of that is going to fall through the, the mesh of the screen or be invisible until you look at it through a microscope. And certainly the, the little seeds of most of the Eastern agricultural complex crops are just invisible in the soil with um, traditional excavation techniques. So what archaeologists started doing was something called flotation. And then uh, we got the flotation revolution. And uh, my colleague at Washington University in St. Louis, Patty Jo Watson, was one of the early archaeologists who implemented flotation in, uh, to a, a large degree in her excavations in Kentucky. And then other archaeologists, when they started doing what flotation, um, ends up with a, a very fine mesh, like a um, even maybe a nylon screen uh, or nylon mesh like a bridal veil or or a um, paint thinner bag or something like that or a very fine um, geological sieve with with mesh that's as fine as 0 0.2 0 0.3 0 0.4 millimeters so that way you're going to catch all these little seeds and uh, by pumping up water from or using some kind of a tank or pumping up water from a creek or, or a lake and then um, pouring in, uh, say, 10 liters of, of a 10 liter bucket full of soil from an organic rich feature, and then letting the, the charred botanical remains float out over an overflow spout and into and being caught by one of these very, any kind of very, very fine mesh cloth or, or um, screen. So when archaeologists started doing a lot of flotation, at these sites in at uh, in the American in Cahokia around Cahokia in the American bottom area where I am, and other parts of Eastern North America, guess what? Guess what was floating out? Like thousands and thousands of these little seeds. And when you start looking at them under a microscope, it's like, wow, they're not the same as the wild ones. They're they've got traits that mark them as having been domesticated. So that that's where this gets really exciting. It's not just the presence of these seeds in their wild form, but it's their seeds in a form that's changed from what we see, you know, in the wild species, right? So those are the, so strong indicators that these had been changed through selective breeding, I guess. And um, it's like, wow, that really kind of changes the whole narrative. Uh, let's talk about what these plants are. When you say the Eastern Agricultural Complex, who are we talking about for species? Well, there are a couple that we know of that are still widely grown and appreciated. And sunflower, I mentioned, is one. Now with the um, modern uh, molecular uh, DNA work by modern botanists, the, the um, homeland, the center of domestication for the big giant sunflowers that we know of now was in, in the Midwest, in like Missouri, Tennessee, right, right around here. And... Um, so that's a, a prominent one. And then there was a squash that's the modern relatives of a, a cucurbita pipo that are um, like acorn squash yeah. and uh, um, crookneck, yellow crookneck summer squash and several other varieties or, or land races or cultivars were again, were with, with, um, with modern molecular work. Uh, it's been determined that there was a separate domestication of squash in the uh, somewhere around the Gulf Coast of the Southeast, uh, Lower Mississippi Valley, and up into the the Mississippi River Valley and other drainages. 
And so, um, although they were, back then, they would have probably been just very small, fruited, gourdy, gourdy looking squashes, but still even, a, even the wild um, relatives of, of them that are out there today are, are useful. The, the seed, even though the flesh is very bitter and the fruit or gourd is very small, they have, um, uh, the seeds can be parched and they're edible and they're nutritious. So they would have been a source of food. Uh, and the, um, the shell, the hard shells, even though they're thinner than um, we might like for a sturdy bowl or rattle, they still would have been useful for all kinds of purposes, for fishnet floats, for um, rattles, for containers uh, carrying around, uh, you know, small things that are that are valuable. And then also, as I said, for food and the flowers would have been edible, just like oh, we, right. like we do today. To do. Yeah. yeah, you know, if I, I wanted to just comment on the on the container thing, because, you know, from my experience, limited experience, but, you know, doing what gets called primitive skills or, or sort of experimental archaeology, I guess. Yeah. Um, one thing you realize is like, wait a second, I've grown up in this incredibly container rich environment. <laughs> you know, we, in fact, we're container saturated. So, you, you know, you, even when you're out in a rural environment there, you look on the side of the road and there's just discarded plastic containers, glass containers, bottle pits. We're just mm -hmm. drowning in containers, you know, I mean, trying to figure out what to do with all these containers. So, uh, it, you know, maybe the average person doesn't think about how difficult it would be to have a watertight container or just any kind of container in the ancient past. And, and so when you have a, like a bottle gourd, it's like, what a useful plant that it is a basically a bottle, <laughs> you know, botanical bottle that can be preserved and used to, to carry liquids or to carry dried goods or whatever it is, like you said, use as flotation device for nets. Um, I, I think it's easy for modern people to underappreciate how valuable and important containers are when you're actually living on the landscape. Absolutely. And you bring up bottle gourd. That's one that it's um, sometimes I like to include that in the Eastern agricultural complex, but it's because it, it definitely was a crop that was grown um, even way before Hopewellian times back into the archaic. We, but it's not actually native to Eastern North America. It's native to Africa and floated across and continues probably to this day at times to float across the Atlantic Ocean to the the east coast of uh well florida and uh, and um central america and south america and we've got it dated at to um you know ten thousand years ago in several different parts of of, of the americas and we think that people uh, picked it up from the beaches and um you know and traveled with it and grew the seeds it's easy to grow both the cucurbita the squash seeds and the bottle gourd seeds uh, they you can store them for more than a year well more than a year and they'll still be viable and the bottle gourd has just been adapted to having the the seeds safe and warm and dry inside that nice hard shell which is buoyant and will float across the ocean and even if it takes a couple of years once it gets to the americas uh, it can crack or a person can come and pick it up and before the before the um people, the ancestors of, of, of uh, Native Americans started using bottle gourds thousands of years ago here. Uh, we think that the megafauna, the mastodons and giant sloths and, and mm. uh, uh, animals like that were, were the dispersers. And then afterwards, it was the, the, after they went extinct, it was the people. And so um, bottle gourd was definitely important and bottle gourd was used by hunter-gatherer societies that were not necessarily on their way to farming or, you know, not, it didn't trigger a, a Neolithic rev revolution or anything like that, even though they were experimenting with, with, uh, with other plants and, um, and spreading these very, very useful container crops all over the, the new world. It's just such a marvelous story because, you know, you would imagine, or at least I would imagine, Africa and North America to be, you know, just, um, I guess, you know, we have this conversation all the time, whether a plant is native or non-native, 
Yeah. And, and you know, what does it mean when a, when a plant makes its way on its own over here from yeah. Africa? It's like, how do you categorize that? It, it doesn't fit in our discrete categories. And that just makes it such a, like a wonderful story, I think. And, and I think you had mentioned maybe some tests done on how long it could be in salt water or something. And, uh, you know, and still be viable uh, to germinate. I just think it's a fascinating story, but I don't mean to get uh, get you off tra- track here. So we just talked about um, sunflower and we talked about the uh, the squashes. I'd like to go through some of these other plants as well, because it's just so fascinating. There was a relative of sunflower that's uh, the scientific name is Iva annua. And the, the um, Iva annua variety macrocarpa for the extinct domesticate. And it is, uh, it looks more like ragweed, giant ragweed as a plant than it does like sunflower because it doesn't have a pretty flower. Mm. But uh, we, we find the, the and, and it's also known as marsh elder, sumpweed or marsh elder or iva. And I'm sorry if I use those terms interchangeably and confuse everybody. But um, it was domesticated at about the same time as sunflower, which was um, by 2,500. BCE, and again, in the Midwest riverine part of Eastern North America. And the, um, the selection was obviously for the, the size of the, the seed, or actually technically a fruit or a keen. And it um, is found in uh, paleofeces dating to the early woodland period in the centuries about 300, 400 uh, and, and so forth, BCE, and it was uh, it was being stored in gourds, but in bottle gourds again, bottle gourds uh, containers mm. being used as storage containers, and in um, textiles bags and things like that that are in these wonderful dry Ozark rock shelters that I utilized for the collections for my dissertation study. And there are other sites like that in Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky. There are dry rock shelters and caves where we find these, um, these bottle gourd, um, I'm sorry, not bottle gourd, we find these iva or sumpweed um, seeds that are clearly domesticated, not like anything that you can go out and find in the wild. So that was uh, another one of the, we call sunflower and sumpweed the oily seeded Eastern agricultural complex crops. Uh, so these would have been high lipid. Yes, exactly. Okay, this is, you know, I'm, I'm very fascinated in like, what do you need to put a diet together? And, and obviously, uh, lipids are crucial, uh, as well as carbohydrates and then proteins. So, um, but often I, I think people forget about, you know, I, I think again, like most of us having lived in this milieu of, of like fat free, low fat, this idea of like fats is you know, here we are again, like, like I said before, we're container saturated. We're also calorie saturated, particularly with carbohydrate and, uh, and lipids. And so maybe people who don't think much about, you know, paleo diets might not realize like just how crucial finding high quality fats on the landscape would be. Um, so of course you'd want a high oil. So, so those are high oil in, um, contrast, let's say to the kinopodiums, I'd assume, which are probably more protein and carbohydrate rich. Yes, exactly. So, uh, have I said enough about, uh, kinopodium and quinoa yet? The, the... Well, well, I think we should hit on that real quick because I, I, my, my question, one question I have about that. So you kind of mentioned, um, and this is sort of a through line in the book that, um, you know, today where most of us are familiar with quinoa and, um, this is a related plant. And of course, that's one of the really fascinating things to me about the Peruvian culture that, you know, it had utilized, uh, something, you know, you hear in the nutrition world, they'll kind of call it a pseudo grain, you know, it looks like a grain kind of acts like a grain, but it's not actually, um, a grain cause not a, not a grass. Um, right. but I was wondering is when I'm outside and I see lamb's quarter, is this a related species or is this the species that they have, um, they, that they had uh, cultivated? Most of the, the, kino, the wild and weedy kinopodium that you're going to run into today and mostly what people call lamb's quarter that's in their gardens and that some people are even, you know, growing in their gardens now because the greens are so good. Mostly that is an old world species, kinopodium album. Ah, um, yep. But there were native species that look very, very much like Kinopodium album. And in fact, it's very, very, it's difficult to, to key them out using most ah. of the botanical keys in the floras of the various regions and states. It's, uh, and, and 
Yeah, it can, I think there's, again, you talked about what is native, what is not native. It gets to be very tricky with the, the Kenopodium swarm that is, <laughs> and some, some of these others. But there was, um, uh, um, there, there were others that were wild or weedy that were not domesticated, but the one that was domesticated is known as Kenopodium berlandieri. Sometimes that's called um, net seed Kenopodium or uh, things like that, because the fruits have very a very net-like reticulation on the, um, the, the pericarp or, or fruit coat. And the uh, very small seeds, but the, uh, the selection during domestication was clearly toward uh, thinner and thinner seed coats. So in the, I, I talked about the Ozark rock shelters, there were bags or um, seed heads, caches of Kenopodium that were pale, not black anymore, that were pale. And when the early researchers were looking at them without a good microscope, they just thought, well, uh, they would be black, except those black seed coats must have all, you know, fallen apart or some little bug came in or <laughs> animal came in and ate them all off. And then it wasn't until we started looking at them carefully under a microscope that we said, look, these have, every, the, you can get a um, the inflorescence, the stem with a fruiting stem with all of the dried up flowering parts and uh, bracts and chaff and everything. And you can tease one of the little, um, you know, fruits, uh, one of the little flower parts all the way with its bracts off. And then you can open it up and there is the whole fruit with the pericot. Nothing is missing. It's perfectly preserved. It's all there, but it's pale. It's not black anymore uh, okay. because the seed coat has been selected for thinness. Which makes it easier to process into a f edible food, I assume? Yes. <clears throat> you know, on page 48 and 49 of your book, there are uh, plates in there. I think a uh, figure 4.1, 4.2. I wish I could just beam these into the heads of the listeners here. They got to get your book. Um, one is of a gourd that, uh, and its contents, which are these kenopodium seeds. The other one is a twine bag. Um, I can't, these are caches that were found in these rock shelters, right? And I cannot right. believe the preservation. I'm, because I believe, correct me if I'm wrong here, but these are 2000 years old. I, yes. I, I, I look at that twine bag. It looks like a friend of mine might've made it last week. I can't, I can't imagine that it preserved for two millennia. Uh, I don't know why, but when I look at that image, I get just like lit up inside. It's so exciting that that something that old could be preserved. And I, I think so often there's this, you know, unfortunate bias towards stone tools in the literature because of just the lack of preservation sometimes of, of you know, plant-based fibers and things like that. So to see something like that, just get really excited about it. But, uh, you know, th these are th clearly um, people were caching <laughs> these foods or at least seeds for growing. What, what are your thoughts on those, um, those caches? Um, these caches, I, I can focus on the, the one that the gourd, uh, uh, figure 4.2, the gourd full of kinopod, domesticated thin testa kinopod seeds. Now, these ones were not uh, pale. They were still black, but still the seed coat was much, much thinner than any of the wilder weedy ones. But they were in a very, very carefully prepared pit in a rock shelter, in a part of a rock shelter that was uh, never wet. It was just powder dry. And the, um, they, the, the people who stored these, these gourds full of these um, seeds, kinopodium seeds, probably as seed stock, probably they intended to come back and, and uh, get them and plant them. Um, Although they would have made a meal or two, but they would have been probably more useful as, as seed stock and it, they never returned. But they cached them extremely expertly. They dug down into this dry, in, probably in between natural um, rock fall of the, of the roof of the rock shelter. And they lined it, they lined their pit with, um, that already had rock lining, but they lined it further with um, with pieces of bark, and it was. Uh, and then some of the pits are lined with old baskets and mats 
and things like that. And then they covered, they, they would put their, their, their bags of, or gourds full of uh, seeds down there or other things that they, saw, that they were storing uh, later on. Uh, um, after a thousand years ago, they were storing corn and beans in the same way. But here, 2,000 years ago, which is the age of this one, we did get direct uh, radiocarbon dates on it. They, um, they covered it with ash, with again, with very oh. dry, um, you know, fire uh, wood ash. Yeah. And, and that would have then um, preserved it, kept it safe from burrowing animals that if the, which are known to wreak havoc to deposits in, in, rock, in dry rock shelters, all rock shelters. But um, these ones, you know, escaped any kind of predation and and uh, and even escaped the um, the people from coming back. And I, you know, I guess some, something probably interfered with their ability to go back and retrieve the their seed stock. Yeah, I can't help but just imagine the person who put it there. You know, <laughs> and here we are. I mean, talk about a legacy. Two thousand years later, we're still talking about them. It's just yeah. it's pretty pretty cool to think about. Uh, tell me about Maygrass. Okay, Maygrass is probably my favorite of the Eastern Agricultural Complex, and it is, um, it it is a um, it's native to uh, parts of southern large parts of southern North America, what is now the United States, and into northern Mexico. But it's um, it doesn't grow north of the Missouri Boot Heel in the Mississippi River Valley anymore, and there's no reason to think that it ever that we ever did have populations of native maygrass this far north. But um, it's an early season grass like little barley, although it could have been modified through selection to, uh, to have been planted in the spring and, and matured later in the summer. But as a wild plant, which is all we've got left to, to study it, uh, observe it by now, it, uh, it, it, it works a little bit like winter wheat. It can, if you plant it in the in the fall or allow it to reseed itself, which it does, and of course across most of its, its range, it can um, it can come up and be you know like a little grass a couple inches high and overwinter that way. And then in the spring it shoots up. And by May uh, in Louisiana and Mississippi, by the later part of May and a farther a little bit farther north by um, early June it makes a, a, a very nice beautiful seed head and it has um, seeds that are that don't that are already edible and they don't have to, they don't have any kind of nasty ons or, or bracts or anything that's going to hurt your mouth or have to be processed heavily and they don't have thick black seed coats that have to be selected for or removed. But, um, and we find lots and lots of maygrass, again, in the paleo feces in, um, from Salts and Mammoth Cave, we find bundles of, of maygrass that are put away, tied up with, with a stem, with a lashing of, uh, or lacing of some sort and put away in these dry Ozark cash pits in the rock shelters. And then we find storage pits where when we do flotation, if these storage pits have lenses of, of burned seeds, which many of them do, um, and we do flotation, they float out in the hundreds or thousands. And even at Cahokia, which was, a, I think, a big surprise once people started doing flotation at Cahokia, that for uh, pits at sites that date to 1050, 1100, 1150, you can, uh, maygrass will be number one seed by count. You'll have more mm. maygrass seeds than, um, than anything else, except some by the time you get to 1100, 1150, you're going to start getting more corn but, or, or maize, but only if you count both the kernel fragments and the cupule fragments. If you only count the kernels, uh, you're going to probably get more, more maygrass. The and cupule some, is what the, what the actual kernel sits in, right? Like that little piece you see yes. left behind on the cob when you bite off the kernel? Exactly, yes. Um, so if I'm hearing you right, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm imagining, you know, as a forager myself, um, so may... Uh, and into early June, you know, we're getting, uh, it's a lot of greens. It's a lot of shoots. Um, some early fruits like strawberry will come up, but as far as real calorie dense carbohydrate, that's something I think about coming later in the season and, and closer to fall, if not into late fall. So 
Maygrass would have provided a dense store of calories early in the season, what would otherwise for a hunter gatherer be a pretty lean time uh, for for those kind of complex carbohydrates, uh, because you'd have probably exhausted a lot of your stores through the winter and into the early spring. So was this a crop that kind of filled that gap until the later season uh, carbohydrates started to come around? That's what we've always posited. That's what we think. And I, I, I do think that. I think you stated it absolutely perfectly. It's, uh, it comes available during uh, otherwise hungry season when your, your stores can be depleted and before anything else is, that has this kind of uh, nutritive value is, uh, is available. And Maygrass has been tested for compositional nutritional analysis and found to be very, very high in proteins and uh, several um, vitamins and, and minerals. It's an extremely good source of, of food. Now, talk to me about erect knotweed. When I when I first read about that, you know, my mind went right away to Japanese knotweed, an unrelated species, I think. And then when I looked up the plant, uh, I was like, oh, that I saw the inflorescence and I was like, oh, that looks like uh, smartweed, what I would call smartweed, you know, yes. or one of the smartweeds. Um, tell us about that and what role it played, what part of the plant was eaten and such. Again, for I, I probably would have been the seeds. I, I should say that for, for Kinopod, it's um, the greens are also extremely nutritious and highly valued, but I don't know of uh, anybody eating maygrass leaves or um, knotweed leaves, but the it's related to buckwheat. And so I think it, I tend to think of it as having been used in, uh, in ways that, that people use um, old world buckwheat today. Mm. And as you know, that's very nutritious. People, the, it's for pancakes and for certain um, cereals that you can buy even today, it's highly, highly advertised for its for its dense nutritional value. Um, so we think that um, porridges and gruels were one of the common ways of using these, and often in mixtures, not necessarily by themselves. And they all um, uh, erect knotweed and and uh, maygrass and well, and kinopodium um, can be ground up, made into a kind of a flour, and that could be made into pancake or like thing or a, a bread like like dish. So we, uh, I, I wish, I, I, in, in in the book, I tried to put in a few uh, recipes, but I don't think I have any recipes that have a not weed in them, but yes, it would have been, and it looks very similar to the, the smart weed that you, that you've observed. How do, what do you do with the smart weed when you get, when you harvest it? I actually don't really use it much myself where I am. Um, I've, I had a species of it in Wisconsin that was quite spicy that, that was like a, uh, used as a flavor. Uh, mm. but yeah, I just recognized the plant, uh, not as something I had really used, but, um, yeah, just looked, it, that's what it looked like to me. Um, yeah. So, there's this question that I have for you about paleo feces. Uh, mm -hmm. This is just mind blowing that this is even a thing. So I want to ask, first of all, is paleo feces synonymous uh, with uh, coprolite? Are they the same thing? And if so, is this something that is, is fossilized or how is this preserved? How do we know it's human? How can it be analyzed? Could you help us understand? Like, like <laughs> obviously we understand that it's, feces from a long time ago from people, but like, how is this studied and, and uh, what kind of data do we actually, are we able to like ascertain from it? Because it's just fascinating to me that this is preserved and uh, in some way that is useful to us. Well, it's direct evidence of human consumption. That's what we value uh, paleo feces highly for. And yes, many people use the term coprolite and paleo feces interchangeably. Again, my colleague, Patty Jo Watson, who, who uh, revolutionized uh, flotation recovery, um, did a lot of cave archaeology. She worked in, in Salts Cave and Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, and other caves. And uh, it turns out that especially Salts Mammoth Cave being the uh, uh, largest uh, cave, interjoined cave system in the world now, they believe, um, people went down to mine mineral crystal uh, crystals and um, gypsum and mirabolite probably for medicinal or ritual purposes and they were down in in the depths of these caves for a long time and they needed to evidently establish latrine areas um, 
which is where we find most of the salts in Mammoth Cave paleofeces. And they are not fossilized. Um, and Patty Jo Watson really disapproved of calling them coprolites because of that. They're, they're soft. You can, um, you know, you need to collect them very carefully with a, a spoon and, you know, put them into a, um, a container where you hope that they don't fall apart too much because they're friable. And then you um, bring them back to the, the lab and uh, people, I, I have never been a paleofecal analyst myself. I have seen, I've been privileged to see some of the, to go down into salts in Mammoth Cave with, with Pat Watson and, and colleagues and to uh, watch colleagues who are analyzing um, the contents of the paleofeces in, in, the, in the laboratory. And you, um, they, they tend to reconstitute them in, in uh, distilled water at which point, Evidently, and I have not witnessed this, but evidently the smell, original smell is discernible. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, you just never imagine you go to the bathroom outside. You just never imagine, you know, all this time later, <laughs> somebody's <laughs> reconstituting it to study what you ate. It's just, it's incredible. Oh my goodness. And then they tend to um, dissect them uh, longitudinal longitudinally and save um, the one half for specialists who, oh gosh, we've done all kinds of analysis, hormonal and for uh, wow. to establish the gender of the, uh, the person who deposited that fecal sample or um, um, other, you know, uh, pollen, that's kind of thing. And then the, the part that the seed analyst uh, uses then, let's say the other half, um, you again, you you sort of spray it down with uh, through nested geological sieves, so that the larger uh, contents. And in the case of salts in Mammoth Cave, they're going to be nutshell fragments. And then the sunflower and sumpweed seeds are going to be pretty big. They're going to be up there in the 2.0 millimeter sieve. And then the um, the arachnoid is going to be a little bit smaller and then one of the smaller sieve sizes and then the kinopodium and maygrass are going to be down in the like 1.0 or 1.5 millimeter sieve sizes and they just look they just look beautiful i mean well wow. some of them are a little a little chewed up <laughs> uh, they've been through the di digestive system but um wow. um they're and the ones that are in salts and mammoth cave are are not are, are preserved because of the um it's not powder dry like the ozark rock shelters but they've never been you know subject to inundation they've never had rain you know coming all the way through them so they're not charred and you can see features of them like the the seed coat uh, patterning and things like that you can see in an unburned state whereas most of the open sites like everything from Cahokia everything from the Hopewellian um, villages and 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 mound centers would not have been preserved had it not been charred it would have just rotted away or oh, been, you know, uh, okay. had it not been charred so we value these uh um, the, the paleofeces themselves would not be readily um, um, identifiable as, as, as feces at all, much less human feces, and um, had they not been preserved in, a, in an, a, 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 you know, a, a better type of environment. Yeah, the cave is like a pretty optimal environment for, I guess you, you don't have strong atmospheric or temperature changes, is that why? Exactly. Yes. Wow. It's fascinating. Um, there's one other plan I wanted to ask you about. Um, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I'm just curious about the role that tobacco played as well. I mean, obviously this was a incredibly important plant, you know, uh, for, uh, ritual and ceremony from, as I understand it, basically the tip of South America, all the way up to, you know, the Inuit people, uh, in the far North at this, yes. where it couldn't be, where it couldn't be planted. It was traded and, and yes. uh, obviously Europeans uh, didn't know about the plant till they got here. And, and we know how that went. Um, and uh, still uh, for anybody who interacts with native people uh, today, um, it's still an incredibly important plant. Um, so yeah, what, you know, this is, this would have been another plant that would have been, and I guess for a long time, uh, there's not really been any question about whether this was grown. We've known for a long time that this was an important agricultural plant um, in right. North America, right? Exactly. And that's an, another one. It was pre, we know that it was present here before maize was intensified. Again, it depends upon the, the chronology. If, the, um, if it was present during the 
early, probably the late early woodland or definitely during Hopewellian times uh, 2000 years ago at the height of the Hopewell mound building culture. And then um, became, remained an extremely important ritual plant um, until it remains so today. And these would have been rusticas, the Nicotiana rustica? That's uh, what is, is it's uh, usually identified or assumed to be or looks like Nicotiana rustica. Ex exactly. There was another species of, uh, of Nicotiana um, that's native to, to, there are several other species, in fact, that are native to California, Oregon, um, the West Coast. And those are the, that's a quadrivalvus. And that's oh, the one okay. that it was planted by the Plains tribes and by the Northwest Coast people. And up in, as you said, up into the Arctic where, um, where it was traded or if it was um, possible at all to grow anything, they would grow tobacco. And they would have, they're known to have had tobacco gardens and to have grown domesticated. But that was the, that was the West Coast um, North American species of tobacco. Now that happened to be, quadrivalvus happened to be the tobacco that was being smoked and grown by the Plains tribes, the Mandan, Hadop, Hidatsa, and Arikara. And we know that during Hopewell times and later, there was some contact across the, the Plains to the Mississippi River Valley. And there have been some, I have looked at some of the uh, charred tobacco seeds and some uncharred tobacco seeds from, um, from special contexts at Cahokia and elsewhere in Eastern North America. And I have wondered whether they might be mm. quadrivalvus rather than rustica. But um, I seem to be one of the few archaeologists who really holds out on that as a major possibility because other people look at them and say, oh, they look so much like Rustica. And they do, but there's a lot of overlap, morphological overlap. So I'm hoping that someday we will have um, ancient DNA um, to methods at our disposal to- uh, uh, Okay, we're not capable of doing that just yet. We might be, we might be, but there would be a lot of um, uh, baseline work that would have to be done with the with the um, the populations, the modern populations, yeah. and then we would have to. And the tobacco seeds are so small, we would have to get really lucky to find uh, preservation that includes that much of the genome to be able to distinguish between one or the other. Yeah, I, I didn't know about quadrivalvus. I'm very, I'm interested in that. I, I think if I understand it today, most cigarette tobacco today is Nicotiana tobacco, um, exactly. which is a fairly weak, uh, you know, because the rusticas, having smoked them, you know, in ceremonial settings here in North America and in South America, packs a punch. I mean, that's a they, very, that's very, very strong. strong. Yeah. So I'd be yeah. curious if the quadrivalvus is also very strong, because I think if the average cigarette smoker today were to smoke a cigarette of rustica, they might, uh, they might have to sit down for a minute. <laughs> um, I've, I've been told that quadrivalvus is not as strong as rustica. Interesting. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, okay, so I'm curious about what this, I guess when we look around the world, um, a lot of times where we see domestication centers, it's not just flora, but also fauna. Um, yes. But I'm assuming the folks here would have had uh, just the domesticated dog. Um, and, uh, you know, as opposed to um, sort of livestock. So I'm curious, uh, this seems like a little bit different than what we often think about when we think about, you know, uh, sedentary farming people or something. So uh, could you kind of help us understand, first of all, dietarily, these, these folks were still hunting. I think in one place you, um, you mentioned uh, faunal uh, assemblages um, that, are, that were largely deer and, and interestingly trumpeter swan. Um, so, you know, I guess what, what's the question? It's like, what was the rest of the diet outside of these plants we're talking about? And, um, also after that, I'd like to, maybe we could get into a little bit about how we think they might've been growing them. Um, you know, in contrast to sort of what we think of today, uh, or maybe in contrast to how maize gets grown. So, but first, um, you know, what, how significant a portion did this suite of plants we've been talking about play in the diet and, and what else was eaten? Well, focusing in on uh, Cahokia, um, again, the, the Cahokia region is so rich in not just the highly um, prime agricultural soils, but in 
the the wild plants and animals and just to mention the important animals and which would have been the hunting would have been done primarily by the men and the uh, farming and the gathering of the wild plants would have been done primarily by the women but the um, white-tailed deer we think was uh, was of course prevalent all over eastern north well over much of eastern north america but possibly hard to come by around cahokia when there were you know tens of thousands of people uh, working or living and working in, in this region we think that it, it looks like the deer populations were somewhat uh, thinned out or depleted but there certainly would have been lots of other um, mammals the raccoons the um, um, the possums, the and then there the other small uh, uh, rodent types of uh, and small mammals. There would have been the uh, all the fish, all the uh, and we know, we can see that they were eating just copious amounts of fish, large fish and small fish. And there would have been the the birds were the for one thing the turkeys and turkeys are still <laughs> being. Yeah. Um, uh, looked at as a possibly having been managed, maybe not domesticated the way that they were in the Southwest, but, um, uh, you know, possibly selected as young ones and brought in and tamed and pinned or things like that. Although the evidence for that is very weak, but people are looking at it and, and trying to, to determine whether or not we might have overlooked that, that wow. kind of evidence for, wow. uh, for pinning or even somewhat domesticating the, the local turkeys. And then the, um, the migratory waterfowl, we're on the Mississippi Flyway here, and there are you know, things like swans you mentioned, and then lots of geese and ducks. And some of them live here year round, it's not, but uh, there are, are huge uh, flocks of them that, that migrate through. So um, I, very, very rich in terms of, of, of animal resources. And then for the wild plants or managed plants, one of the things that uh, was available, not necessarily right in the bottomland, but not very far away in the uh, up and the upland uh, prairie and, and uh, oak uh, hickory savanna areas would have been the nuts, the acorns and the um, hickory nuts and to some degree also pecans. And we think that they that there were groves of nut and fruit trees similar to the ones in the in the southeast that the Europeans described as orchards and so that they would have been the trees would have been widely enough spaced out to maximize productivity and there would have been selection for the, the uh, acorn and the hickory trees that produced the the best tasting and the and that nuts and that were the most prolific nut producers they call them thrifty trees and so that uh, mm -hmm. these would have had space made for them. And then there would have been constant understory burning and clearing out of the, of the area so that the human harvesters could compete with the squirrels and the, the deer <laughs> right. and the raccoons and the things like that. So, and then there would have been a lot of um, water plants as well. There would have been the American lotus and the spatter dog oh, yeah, right. or the nufar. There, um, there I can go out, out my door and go to wetland areas that are not very far away at all that just have lots of these um, these water plants growing that are, and for the Sagittaria, do you, do you harvest that one? The, uh, Sagittaria the would be arrowroot? Yeah, like arrowroot. Yeah, I don't often, but I'm familiar. Yeah, wapato also called? Wapato, exactly. And then, um, so there, yeah, so to go in and, and, and harvest those tubers, we do not find them in the archaeological record because they just don't preserve. Uh -huh. And, um, but we're pretty sure that they would have been digging those up and other wild um, tubers, the, um, some of the, some of the plants that have the, the uh, yeah, edible underground plant parts that would, would have been harvested. And, and then the fruits, you mentioned the strawberries, mulberries, um, wild raspberries and grapes. Grapes would have mm. certainly, and, oh, and persimmon. Persimmon was a really big one. And I think, again, that would have been one that they would have been growing in their courtyard areas or at the right. edges of the, the settlements. Would they've had pawpaw up there as well? Yes. Oh, man, it sounds like a good, I, it sounds like good living, you know, it's like, <laughs> gosh, I just, can I get a time machine? Um, I'm, exactly. I, I was fascinated to see acorns because 
So I'm, you know, I process acorns every year with my wife and, and we, ah. we make food out of it. And it is such a lengthy process. So it probably takes me about 10 days to uh, convert, you know, well, I could actually, I got to dry them first. It's a lengthy process, you know, versus like, let's say a hickory nut, you can crack it open, you can eat it. It's like ready to go. <laughs> Um, and I joke with my wife all the time, like if you did, if you could just eat acorns off the ground, would anybody have practiced agriculture? It seems like you could have just <laughs> lived off them, you know, but, uh, but I think it was really cool uh, that they were still doing that at a time where they had all of these other food resources, given how much work they are to render edible. Um, and I'm, I would just be so curious to see how they did that on a scale large enough to be, you know, worth it because man, it takes, it takes so much work, but um what what would these plantings have looked like for uh, this Eastern agricultural complex? And, and would it be different from what we picture in our head when we picture, uh, you know, modern day agriculture? You know, obviously it would be, but but um, there's a chapter uh, or a section of your book called The Myth of Slash and Burn. And I'm wondering kind of how that plays in um, to our perception of what um, indigenous North Americans were doing versus what they might have actually been doing. Well, certainly by... Um... Cahokia's heyday after 1000 CE, um, there were permanently open fields. And we can see this in the pollen record that probably that started hundreds of years earlier before, even before corn was intensified. So it would have been uh, opening up more and more of the bottomland for, for fields um, to be devoted to the Eastern agricultural complex crops. And then uh, corn came in, and then you would have needed even more fields or more um, intensive types of intercropping or whatever. And people used to characterize both pre-Mississippian and Mississippian farming as slash and burn, as you said. But several authors, um, William Doolittle, who's a cultural geography who specializes in North American agriculture, and Jane Mount Pleasant, who is an agronomist of Tuscarora ancestry, who has practiced uh, the Three Sisters, the Iroquois and corn beans and squash farming. Um, as they have, uh, you know, set us straight in, in the last 10 or 20 years and just, you know, uh, said, you know, so farewell to the myth of slash and burn agriculture, although I don't know that it's ever going to get out of some of the uh, <laughs> permanently in the literature. <laughs> yeah, but they would have been um, and I, I wish I could tell you more about what a field would have looked like either both before and after corn uh, became a, a primary staple. But I think that uh, from the amounts of seeds that we get in the archaeobotanical record for early Cahokia, where we have lots of corn, we have lots and lots of all of the Eastern agricultural complex crops. I think there would have been these large uh, permanently open fields divided up into um, smaller zones or subplots. And within these, you could have had some devoted to a single species, or you could have had uh, intercropping. You could have had uh, one, uh, my colleague, Natalie Mueller, who has been experimenting with the cultivation of these, um, especially with kinopodium and maygrass and, and uh, erect knotweed and little barley. She found that especially erect knotweed and uh, kinopodium grow well together when, when uh, uh, you know, when they're just, you know, planted all in, in among themselves in a plot. And you still have to thin them. You can't just sort of um, broadcast, you know, a, a, a mixed handful of these seeds or broadcast one species and then another species on top of it uh, without eventually thinning them out and giving the, each plant some room to spread out, you know, to open up and, 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 and get plenty of sun and get bushy enough to, to be productive. Um, so, uh, and and we don't know in terms of the corn there there wouldn't have been beans there were no beans at at Cahokia to grow up the the corn stalks but there was a a, a wild bean that we find Strophocyles helvola and then there's another one that uh, uh, Physiolus polystachios a wild bean that's closely related in the same genus as the common bean or kidney bean. And we find those together with the kinopodium. So they might've been growing up the kinopodium stalks or they might've been yeah. growing up the corn stalks later on. Um, I think sunflower, I go with the um, Maxidiwiak or Buffalo Bird Woman's um, maps of her uh, gardens out in the 
Hadatsah and, and, and Mandan region of the Missouri, Upper Missouri River, um, in terms of planting sunflowers around the borders of these fields or gardens. And even though the, uh, the book that we have, Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden, is, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful book, um, it uses the term garden. I think it was the publishers. It was the uh, Gilbert Wilson, who was the early ethnographer who documented this um, detailed agricultural system. He, uh, his dissertation was called something like um, Hidatsa Indian agriculture. He didn't use the term garden, which makes it seem small scale and like your, you know, like your grandmother out there mm -hmm. puttering around in the right. garden, because these women were producing massive amounts of food. But um, they planted, yeah, as I said, the sunflower around the edges, and they had corn and they had some special squash gardens and some squash that was grown near the, the corn. But the fields were uh, uh, just, you know, permanently open. And they, uh, um, as, as Jane Mount Pleasant has pointed out, before the plow came in, and when the main tools, tillage tools were digging sticks and, and um, you know, wooden handled um, stone or deer scapula or bison scapula hoes, um, you you didn't get the soil depletion that you got, and especially right. if you were hilling, you could yeah. uh, you could keep planting one plot for far more years than the two or three, even with right. corn, even with oh, corn, yeah. which is a, yeah. So so the need to, the need for constant rotation is in part an artifact of the of the type of plowing that we do. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. I'd exactly. actually never thought about that. Um, it's kind of a strange question I have for you, but um, just curious if it's something you've heard about or thought about. Uh, you know, there was that time, uh, again, probably about what, maybe two decades ago, decade and a half ago, we start hearing a lot of this uh, kind of murmurings in the anthropology of like, why did people go to agriculture? It's like mm -hmm. so much more work. It was really hard on our bodies. You see, you know, shrinking in the skeletons and, and you know, cavitation in the dentition and all these kind of artifacts of, that emerge out of the agricultural lifestyle. And it's like so much less leisure time, hierarchies emerge, like, why did we do this? And then one of the things that I've always found fascinating was the idea, especially, you know, with the sort of Mesopotamian domestication event, it's like, well, it doesn't take you long once you have wheat to realize you can make beer. And would consistent access to alcohol be, you know, one of the reasons that people would want to have a consistent source of these carbohydrates like that? And I always thought that was really interesting. And um, having been, you know, down to South America and and drinking chicha, uh, the corn beer there, it's like, would, I guess, I guess there's two parts to this. Do you think that uh, prior to maize being as widespread that they had an alcohol source? Do we know anything about that? And uh, because it seems like if you're going to have a large city like that, <laughs> people like to have drinks. And then uh, do you think that the rise of maize, that that could have been a factor as well? Or, or is that something you think is kind of like not necessarily uh, important? Before maize, Maygrass would have been a candidate for, for fermentation and brewing, but we don't have any evidence for that. It's just a speculation that that's and, uh, one of the, the things, or maybe even the primary thing that was being done with maygrass. And even if it wasn't fermented, I think it would have been a very, uh, a, a very a good possibility that it was ground into a, a fine enough powder to just be mixed into a, a drink. And that um, uh, the main use of, of uh, a close relative of maygrass, which is canary grass, an old world phalaris, uh, looks ex almost exactly the same as, as maygrass, and, but it has been domesticated and is grown primarily for um, um, poultry feed. Even in the northern plains of the United States, it's, uh, there are big fields of canary grass being grown for, for, uh, for bird feed, poultry, you know, and, farm animal uh, birds, not just parakeets and canaries. <laughs> but, um, the, um, and certainly there would have been times if it was mixed with uh, some of the saltscape paleofeces that also have a lot of strawberry seeds. And we're thinking, well, strawberries would have been something that could have been oh, you know, yeah. thrown in with, uh, with the maygrass seeds and could have caused a, uh, made into some kind of a, a fermented beverage. But um, today, there's a product that you can buy 
called leche de apiste and it's made with this uh canary grass ground up powder canary grass powder the ground up from the seeds and mixed into a um a drink a smoothie like drink or you know using a blender or something else to form this drink and it's uh used for um women who are trying to control blood sugar or weight mm. that, that kind of thing so and nobody i don't know of any uh recipe for, in, for anywhere in the world where um phalaris uh canary grass or any other phalaris species is actually cooked like a rice or like a you know a tabbouleh or anything like that do you no i don't know so that just and i've tried to cook may grass without uh, great success as well. so, <laughs> so that could have been a a drink and eastern north america um is one of the very few places in the world in fact there might not be another place where people have access to these kinds of grains where at at, at contact or ethnographically there was an alcoholic a fermented beverage tradition there was a, a different beverage that was extremely important. Sorry, did you just say this is one of the few places where that didn't happen? Yes. Oh, that's fascinating. So you're saying most places when Europeans made contact, they had some kind of ethanol drink. But yes. But here, not so much. Wow. Right. They were yeah. into, and I, I, you know, I'm not ruling it out that, that there wasn't ever one, or, but, uh, you know, a, a fermented beverage tradition, but they didn't have chicha anything like chicha here and they um their 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 beverages were teas were you know medicinal mm. teas and and uh, just uh, you know tasty tea sumac tea which is both medicinal and delicious and um other things like like that so it was uh, it, it it is it's it's very unusual it's very exceptional and then there was the black drink are you familiar oh, with that? Yop, yopan. Yopan, yes. And now there is evidence that uh, um, yopan leaves, Ilex vomitoria, were being, were present at Cahokia. They're finding the residues wow. in some of the special looking pottery, the beakers, the thin walled beakers. So I, th we think they were drinking that. And yopan, I, the, the genus and species can be grown here people have it in their yards and um but we don't have and and the uh, europeans noticed yopan being grown in the by the cherokees up in the you know high elevations of of uh, western north carolina so um they could have been growing yopan here as well or they could have just been relying on their um, extensive trade partners and trade networks right it's such a lovely drink i guess for folks listening i just want to kind of highlight that's north america's native caffeine containing plant and uh yeah very closely related to uh yerba mate uh and yes. um wayusa which are used down in uh south america so um yeah very that's a, such a fascinating thing and and you actually mentioned at one part in the book um the presence of limited detura seeds as well jimson weed which is a pretty strong um entheogenic plant. Uh, so I thought yes. that was interesting as well, uh, you know, because obviously the tradition for that extends down into South America as well, where they have some uh, uh, tree species. Um, and those are pretty strong. A shaman yes. once told me in the Amazon, if I wanted to drink Datura, I would need to, to prepare for six months. And then he would bring two other shaman and they would have to tie me to the ground for three days <laughs> so, wow. to give people a sense of how strong that, uh, that can be as a hallucinogen. So... Yes. Oh, that's really fascinating. That, that is something for uh, specialists. For you, you, you definitely don't want to do that without a, um, <laughs> yeah. a, a, a very, very expert uh, guide. Yeah, tread lightly. Um, so I guess uh, sort of in conclusion, uh, one of the things I just wanted to make sure I touched on was there's this kind of theme in your book, particularly toward the end, which I thought was so cool and I actually didn't really expect, but was the idea of uh, de-extincting or resurrecting some of these cultivars. So I wanted to give you some space to speak on that uh, because it kind of seems like slightly ambitious given the kind of terrible food culture we have here at present, but but also very exciting to me, the idea of that. So I just want to give you some space to uh, to share your thoughts and feelings on on potentially bringing back, particularly it seemed like you were excited about the Kinopodium. Yes, uh, I would like to refer people to the Lost Crops Network to uh, my colleague, Natalie Mueller, and her, uh, the people that are doing a lot of the experimental growing and, 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 and seeing 
how long it takes, for example, to select for certain properties of the um, um, Kinopodium and the, the Iva and the the erect knotweed. And uh, Natalie and her colleagues are finding that these uh, plants do have a lot of what we call phenotypic plasticity. So there are some changes that are, are, um, are visible in the directions that we think we would want to take them just by, just by planting them in, in a good soil and without being crowded and, you know, plenty uh, coddling them, giving them plenty of water. But there are other things that are obviously going to take, um, selection over a number of generations. And then we would get into the much more thorny um, uh, prospects of, of uh, using some sort of genetic editing, you know, using CRISPR-Cas9 or something like that, if we were to understand no! enough. <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah. And that's where, that's where we have to really, really soul search and yeah. uh, communicate very, very carefully with uh, descendant communities who intellectual property is, uh, you know, is at stake here. Wow. But it is neat, the idea that we could have, um, I mean, I guess sunflower is an example too, but the, the idea of, uh, I don't know, I, I was born in North America. So the idea of, of eating things from here, I don't know, makes me happy. So I, I like, I like your, uh, I like that you took it there at the end, uh, kind of in conclusion, what, what is your big picture hope? The book was published if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in 2019. Um, yes. And then obviously the world went crazy. And so now we are sort of settling back and, and things are kind of coming back to normal. And uh, so it's kind of a strange time for your book to come out because I imagine there was so much noise, right? So um, I'm wondering, you know, now that things are quieting down again, um, everybody's starting to like, you know, come back out, um, information spreading around again, uh, and, and there's more than one story. You know, what is your big hope for uh, this book um, and this kind of information as it as it filters out? Uh, because um, it obviously has a potential to really shift how Americans see their history here um, and uh, how we understand the you know the native people of this this continent. Um, I guess it really has big implications for world history. So, yeah, yeah, just kind of curious, like what your big picture hope is for the legacy of this work and uh, and you know what you'd like to to do with it in the future too. Well, I'm retired now, but I'm hoping that that students and colleagues and young researchers will will take this farther and farther. And the big, I don't know, the one word is agrobiodiversity. I'm just moving away from the monocropping and yeah. and looking at the at the potential for uh, different crops and and more nutritious crops and crops that that uh, grown cultivated in in ways that uh, are not causing the uh, depletion of the topsoil and the uh, erosion and and so many other problems that our modern agriculture is. Yeah, it's been uh, just awesome to talk to you, Gail. I, this book has really shifted the, you know, it's not often something comes along that really changes your paradigm about, you know, like, like how you see the world itself. And this, this really shifted at least the way I see North America. So I just want to say thank you for such an incredible book. As I mentioned, it's been coming up um, a lot lately amongst colleagues of mine. So I know that it's, um, it's filtering into um, the popular culture, at least amongst foragers and such. So, um, you know, well done. And uh, yeah, thank you for taking the time today. Thank you for coming on and explaining all this for me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.